in terms of positional value. And we had this conversation with Jacob and Fonte about positional value. I love that conversation and like positional need and all that good stuff. In my mind, I played it out. Right. And Paul, you said this, like you're drafting for a wide receiver three, right? Yes. Granted DJ Moore, Keenan Allen might get hurt. Roman Dunze turns into wide receiver two for a good chunk of the season. That's all hypothetical. And let's say it's a perfect world, right? Let's say you play out this offseason and you come out of this draft with Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze. And now training camp's coming up and we're talking about can we get Yannick and Gakwe back for a cheaper contract, right? Can we address the defensive end position and yada, yada, yada? How do we add depth to defensive tackle? This, that, and the other. And I feel like that route, while it's fun because it's offense. There's a lot of question marks. It's a rookie quarterback with a rookie wide receiver and two veteran wide receivers. And yeah, like you can only spread the ball around so much. So let's say in a perfect world, you have Roma Dunze with Caleb Williams and he's playing great. Roma Dunze is getting you 700 yards maybe and like five to five to seven touchdowns. Can I interview yeah. you real quick? Yeah. Listen, I'm so far on one end of this whole thing where mm -hmm. if Marvin Harrison Jr. falls to nine, I, I would be I would be so happy because it guarantees me a trade partner. Yeah, same. That that that's how I feel about the wide receiver position. And I know, me Richie, you were laughing at probably the idea. I would pass him up. The other part so, of this is if Caleb Williams is everything you hope he is. We're talking about like you want to compare to Aaron Rodgers. This is a guy that made Randall Cobb like a Pro Bowler. So Julian Edelman was on his podcast talking about uh, how Tom Brady. You know, he, he would invite him to workouts and on a normal day with wide receiver training in the summer, you know, they ask you to run routes, route trees, fix each other's like body positioning and stuff like that. Quarterback invites you, they ask you to run 25, 30 routes, right? Like that's a heavy, heavy work day, right? You're running 25 hard full speed routes. Julian Edelman mentioned that I think he said he, Tom Brady had him run 75 to 90 routes, right? And the whole time Tom Brady is saying, Look, when I throw the ball, I expect you to put all your weight on the inside foot leverage, peel back, and hit the sideline. And Julian Edelman just constantly kept talking about how Tom Brady, a quarterback, was probably the person that made him better at wide receiver than his wide receivers coach, his head coach, his coaches all the way through, right? When a quarterback can dictate what they want you to do, you become more successful. And that's why I was never in the favor of the Justin Fields narrative. Like he just needs three number one wide receivers and he's going to be a stud. Like what? that's a problem. Where was Julian Edelman drafted? What round? Seventh round. Seventh round pick 11. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. That That's why positional value. That That's exactly it. You're spending your 1-1 one, one at quarterback. Ideally, the risk has already been taken. You don't need to pad that room with guys to make Caleb Williams that much better. You already gave him DJ Moore and Keenan Allen. You're talking about a, you're playing the hypothetical offseason game. You come out of the draft with Roma Dunze and Caleb Williams, and you're just fingers crossed that everybody's gelling, has chemistry, and now you're hoping that you can fill some positions of need on defense, right? So you're saying Caleb, Roma Dunze in a perfect world with everybody healthy and Caleb Williams being a 4,000-yard passer – Romo Dunze is coming out of the season with maybe 700 yards and five touchdowns, and he's probably in the rookie of the year competition. Flip that over, and now you have Caleb Williams. Now you take Jared Verse, right? In an ideal scenario, Jared Verse on this defense, and part of this is also I don't think defense is the most inconsistent part of football. You can have a top five defense one year and a 15th ranked defense the next year and nothing changed, right? So you can't rest on your laurels because the last six, seven games of the year, you were a top five defense. You still have to improve defense because that stuff is always changing. Somebody gets a step slower. Somebody messes up their gapping position. Somebody's coach that they liked and was the secret sauce just left. And so now you got Jared Verse. A good year for Jared Verse opposite – a good, like, a Jervon Dexter year that's up, uh, a Montez Sweat year. Jared Verse should end with, like, nine sacks, ten sacks, 11 sacks, Yeah, right? So I'd rather have Caleb Williams, 11 sacks from Jared Verse, and go get Tyler Boyd or Hunter Renfro in training camp or wait for a training camp wide receiver cut. Somebody's getting cut in, in training camp this year that you don't expect. Somebody's going to be a cap casualty that you still don't expect. We just got Stefan Diggs traded for a second, essentially second or mid third round pick 21 days before the draft. 
You don't see defensive ends getting traded today. What do you think our biggest needs are on this defensive line first? Um, Definitely right where you have it. I, I agree. A defensive end and then interior defensive line. Uh, take a look throughout the league at, you know, top 10 defensive ends, top 10 defensive tackles, contract-wise. If these guys are getting paid, that means they're out there performing, right? And then you right. kind of uh, just take the average um, draft position of those guys, you find that defensive ends and defensive tackles go in round one. That's why my preferred choice is to trade back, because I still think you yeah. can get one of those guys. Ultimately, my number one thing is trade back. I just think that, uh, you know, and if not defensive end, outside of that, you know, I'm I'm one that, like, even if Marvin Harrison Jr. fell to nine, I would be happy because I'd be getting a bigger haul for trading back. The position of need is wide receiver three. And, I mean, I get that you're doing it for the future. We still need a wide receiver. I'm not saying we don't. I'm just not willing to take one at nine. And I think I would much more prefer the haul it would bring me if he dropped back rather than to take one player. I, I just think this team still needs more depth. It really does. And and listen, I'm not, and I just want to say, I'm not opposed to the idea in general. I just think you have to be in position to do it. That That's not where we're at. I still feel we're pretty depleted, and therefore we still need to address that first. It doesn't make sense for them to maybe take offensive line in the first round, yeah. but I, I've watched Powers Johnson. Yeah. And God damn, am I impressed. Like, I've watched that guy toss people around, and you look at him and go, yep, he's ready for the next level. But, uh, yeah, what, what do you think about the upcoming draft and some of the prospects there? You got anybody you like? Jackson Powers Johnson, I think that's, you know, totally valid to, you know, to view him in that light. I see him on a, a similar tier. I wouldn't say he's quite at the level of a Tyler Linderbaum coming out of Iowa, but he's pretty damn close. And you, you look at him on the same level as, say, a Creed Humphrey coming out of Oklahoma, which I think is pretty high praise, considering the fact, one, I had him as a first-round grade. He didn't end up going that high because, you know, for whatever reason, I'll never quite understand positional value, whatever. But That's exactly what it is, positional value. Yeah, which I think is – I thought was BS because Creed Humphrey is very clearly a great football player, and he has been in the pros – I think Powers Johnson is at a similar level as a prospect. I think Powers Johnson's going to go round one for sure. I wouldn't be surprised. Somewhere around that uh, Dolphins Steelers 2021 range, I wouldn't be shocked if he goes there. If he does fall into the second, then I think that some team's going to get really lucky and be able to take advantage of that because he's young, he's strong, he's athletic. He's intelligent. I think he checks just about all the boxes you could at center. Just the one year as a starter, but even then, his uh, 2022 season, he showed a lot of versatility as essentially Oregon's sixth man along the offensive line. And he was one of the most efficient offensive linemen, granted in you know not a ton of snaps, but still probably, I want to say like 200 or something as the key reserve for Oregon. And he was incredible. And he was incredible again this past year. He's someone that I really like. If the Bears trade back, I definitely consider him. Uh, I think, at least in my honest opinion, you're taking one of Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors at nine or you're trading back. If neither of those guys are available at nine, you trade back if there's a good enough offer. Obviously, that's way easier said than done, but I think it's pretty clear where the value is. Like, you're, Look, you're not going to get Marvin Harrison Jr. at nine. You know, just being realistic. So I know there's been some chit chat about Marvin Harrison Jr. recently, and you look at last year, uh, Jalen Carter wasn't going to drop to nine either, but he did. I mean, you never, never know how these things play out. Um, however, I think you're right. The the chances of Marvin Harrison Jr. dropping that far are slim to none. But when you look at positional value, like you said, wide receivers, you can pick them up all throughout the draft. There's not a pass rusher or an interior defensive tackle that you would find appealing with pick nine? I think the Falcons are going to take Dallas Turner, the edge rusher out of Alabama at eight. I just think that makes too much sense. They've invested at wide receiver. They've signed Kirk Cousins, so they have their quarterback for the next couple of years. Edge rushers, always, it's been a massive need for Atlanta for years. They've never addressed it. Turner is a freak athlete. He has the highest ceiling of any edge rusher in this class. I think that he'd make a lot of sense there. He's not my top edge rusher but he's really damn close. So I have 
Jared Verse is my top edge rusher in this class just because I think he's the safest and the fact that I have really, really similar grades with him, Dallas Turner, and Layat Tulatu out of UCLA. They're all neck and neck and neck on my board in the way that they grade it out. It's just a matter of, okay, how am I going to organize them? Because I think Latu had the best film, but he's got an extensive injury history. Who knows, you know, how, what the medicals are going to look like. We, you know, as outsiders, we don't have access to that information. I can't confidently say, oh, he's going to be fine, you know, because he did have to medically retire in college. Dallas Turner, the most physically gifted of the three, the fastest of the three, but at the same time, I don't think he's the most technically sound. If anything, I think he's the least technically sound of the top three edge rushers. Jared Verse, in my opinion, is the uh, best blend of being a safe pick, being a high quality technician off the edge, having a good understanding of how to string together movements with your hands in order to shed blocks, both as a pass rusher and as a run defender. And he's a very good athlete too. I think that that's getting lost as he tested incredibly well. His, his burst off the snap on tape, his flexibility turning the corner, all very good. So versus my top guy, from a pure value perspective, I don't think I'd take him at nine. I'd 100% be down, say, if you trade to like 12 or 13, and he's still there, I'd take him in a heartbeat. When I look at um, draft history, yeah, and like you mentioned, positional value, uh, one thing I keep seeing is that you know these wide receivers – they get taken all over the place and oh, yeah. they tend to hit more in later rounds than some of the other positions do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just some names that come to mind. Antonio Brown was a fifth round pick. Tyreek Hill was a fifth round pick. Cooper Cup was a third round pick. I mean, last year you had Puka Nakua going yeah. to the fifth round. So y- you can find guys later on in the draft that wind up coming out and really having some impact um, mm-hmm. on the field right away. And uh, however, when it comes to defensive ends, defensive tackles, Mm-hmm. You look at all these guys like Joey Bose. The only one that's out there is like Max Crosby went in the fourth round. Yeah. But everybody else was like a first or second round pick. It's just Ryan Poles constantly preaches value. Value wise, is it worth it? So you mentioned Brandon Marshall. Brandon Marshall was a fourth round pick. If we go through and just take top five wide receivers drafted in the past, we have AJ Green who did not win a Super Bowl. Calvin Johnson, who did not win a Super Bowl. Braylon Edwards did not win a Super Bowl. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just going off memory here. Larry Fitz was in a Super Bowl, but didn't win one. Charles Rogers did not win a Super Bowl. Andre Johnson did not win a Super Bowl. Peter Warwick did not win a Super Bowl. You got to go all the way back to 1996, where Keyshawn Johnson was taken at number one overall. And he was taken by the Jets. He definitely didn't win one with them, right? The history shows us that a top five wide receiver doesn't necessarily make the impact that, for example, a top five quarterback could make. Everybody's just giving it their best shot. Nobody really truly knows what players are going to become at the end of the day, right? My mindset is always that this thing's a crapshoot. Give me more darts to throw at the dartboard. You know, the more draft picks I could accumulate, I feel the safer the future is. And, you know, the more you can do with it overall. But hey, you never know. You really, truly never know. I just, this is in no specific order whatsoever. I'm sure I left some guys out here and there, but I just, you know, took a good handful of guys and kind of put it together. So we got Nick Bosa, Micah Parsons, Miles Garrett, TJ Watt, Max Crosby, Brian Burns, and I even added added Montez Sweat in there. And as you can see, these guys, a lot of them were first round talent guys, right? So that's defensive end. And when we look at defensive tackles, we kind of see the same thing going on, right? So I, I just, once again, a handful of guys, no specific order. We got Aaron Donald, Chris Jones, Dexter Lawrence. We got Williams, Cameron Hayward, DeForest Buckner, Jonathan Allen. I'm not trying to knock on Marvin Harrison Jr. I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't draft Marvin Harrison Jr. I'm just kind of trying to lay out some of these tendencies out there and whatnot. And when we do take a look at the wide receivers, right, and I took a good handful of them, Justin Jefferson, Tyreek Hill, A.J. Brown, C.D. Lamb, DJ Moore, Amon Ross St. Brown, Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup, Devontae Adams, Keenan Allen, Jamar Chase. And here we see a lot of fluctuation, right? A lot of these drafts are stacked pretty deep with wide receivers. So you can find guys like Tyreek Hill in the fifth round. I mean, just coming to mind, Antonio uh, Brown was a fifth round pick as well. So you have more of a chance of drafting a position like this later in the round and having it succeed. 